With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Twenty twenty has certainly been a year of challenges. Very few people have escaped the issues that dealing with a global pandemic has brought about. Health and fitness is just one sector, battling to be heard at the top table of government. And as we record this episode of Great British Bosses, a second lockdown will close gyms and leisure facilities across England, bringing about concerns for businesses, job losses and importantly, the nation's health, well-being and resilience. I'm Michael. And I'm John, and this is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy, the podcast where we speak to the men and women who run sport in this country. We've had many years of experience of working with big-name sports stars and travelling the world to attend the biggest events, but as well as elite sport, we recognise the importance of grassroots activity and mass participation. And whilst Joe Wicks became the nation's and my favourite PE teacher in 2020, analysis from Sport England showed a significant drop in activity levels during the first lockdown. And now a combination of closed facilities and the winter weather could see participation decline even further. It's a significant challenge. I'm Hugh Edwards. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of UK Active, which is the membership organisation for the fitness, leisure and physical activity sector. Hugh, fantastic to have you on Great British Bosses. First of all, then, tell us a bit about UK Active. What is it that you do and how has the organisation grown? Yeah, so thanks very much for having me on. Um, UK Active has been around for approaching 30 years now, Michael, and it was originally called the Fitness Industry Association, set up in the early 90s uh, to represent the needs of the fitness and leisure sector. Uh, It changed its sort of branding and its name around the time of 2012, the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, to really look at, you know, how it can bridge from that sort of core lobbying into the wider discussion around uh, the role of physical activity in society. Um, Sitting here in 2020, um, it's got three roles, really, in terms of its organisation to to protect and support its members, especially in these challenging times of COVID-19, to represent and lobby the case for the sector and its role in society, and to support Uh, the growth of the sector, both in its development, but also in its influence across wider societal challenges as well. And as we sit here in 2020, on the day we're recording this, we've entered a second lockdown. So is it fair to say the work you do has never been more important than right now? 100%. And, um, you know, we've got another important month ahead supporting our, our members who are, you know, obviously incredibly anxious, incredibly frustrated about the closure. I think it's you know, an opportunity to reflect on where we've got to up to last Friday, when Friday evening, when we were reading the headlines coming through that it was going to be a closure this week. You know, everything that we had done as a sector since the the reopening from July had proven the the safety record in the sector, the low prevalence of COVID. That was being shown in Scotland and Northern Ireland where there, you know, when tighter restrictions took place and closure didn't happen. Um, That happened throughout the whole tier three uh, rollout, especially when the U-turn in Liverpool, that every tier three a decision between local leaders was seeing gyms and leisure centres open because there's a recognition of the vital role they play in the physical and mental well-being of, of their communities. So 
great frustration, great anxiety, uh, and real fear about the impact on on people's physical and mental well-being. Do you understand why they did it? I think there is a decision to look at a blanket coverage across the country. You know, obviously, you can see um, the the rising rate in, in in COVID across areas of of the of the UK and England especially. Um, the question we would have is is twofold. You know, is this a targeted approach? You know, which what we are seeing with tier with tier three approach. You know, number one is you know from our perspective, you know, we're looking at a sector which has really shown, and the data we provided to government, you know, week in week out, has shown that low prevalence. You know, very lack, you know, a real lack of of evidence of any of of any a connection association with any outbreaks from COVID, but also real prevalence in terms of of cases coming through. Uh, so that's that's the first area. But the second area is, you know. We are really worried that, you know, whilst trying to sort out one crisis, you're going to create another crisis in inactivity and mental health. You know, springtime where you could really understand the blanket coverage of going to something unknown, you can understand and it's frustrating. November is a very different beast. You know, um, you know, the messaging, which is important around exercise and everybody trying to do as much as they can to exercise during this period. But the, the options are really restricted. And, you know, many millions of people depend on on these facilities for their physical and mental well-being. And so restricted them for at least a month and we have to give consideration to whether this will just be a month um, is a real worry uh, in terms of the some of the fundamental um, public health challenges we face as a nation. How big is the sport and leisure business and if lockdown continues for more than four weeks heaven forbid what impact will that have? I mean economically it's a it's a major force in in the UK in terms of jobs and, and wealth creation. You know, you're looking at excess of eight billion pounds that a billion pound value of a sector, you know, over twelve million members. Um if you look to the active life survey, the last one which was done prior to this, you know, people doing uh, fitness and, and swimming was uh, achieving the chief medical officer's guidance of 150 minutes a week was seventeen point one million people a week. Um, this is the bedrock and the backbone of activity in this country, uh, and you know this this inf- this this sector is is a driving force between activity levels. You know only only second to to walking, and so you know it needs to be protected. We need to have, as the prime minister says, have his arms wrapped around this sector in order to support uh, its survival, but also the role it can can play. So remove that from the 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 um, the equation as you as you set it in your intro, and. You know, activity levels go off a cliff edge. You talked about some of your various emotions. You talked about being anxious, frustrated, whatever. Are you angry with the decision? I think it's frustration more than more, more than anger, Michael. I think it's what we need to need now is this has happened. Well, what's the plan, right? You know, we now have a month in which you know we're going to have a closure of the sector. Two things need to happen from the government. The first thing we need to see a plan for how you know, the sector is, is presented and promoted back to, back to the public. You know, this will have an impact on consumer demand across all parts of the sector. And so we need to have a really strong narrative about the essential service that these facilities play within the community. Number one, we haven't seen enough of that direct messaging from government about the value of the sector uh, that it plays. And then secondly, there needs to be a real plan about recovery. You know, we have been lobbying heavily for government for a long period of time that there needs to be uh, a bespoke recovery plan, recovery support for the whole sector, uh, as seen with hospitality, as seen with art sector. We haven't seen that. And so this is the month to really iron out those plans. We need to see taxation support. We need to see regulatory support. We need to see the equivalent of the eat out to help out for our sector. Uh, that's an essential. That is a, a fundamental if we're going to see uh, the sector get back to the, the levels it was prior to COVID. It feels like you're running a really strange race in a really odd competition, if I can put it in those terms, against these other sectors you mentioned, like retail, like hospitality and like the arts as well. It must be difficult to try and get your case across at the top table when you're sat opposite the sports minister or the culture minister, whoever it is that that you have to deal with you. Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, in some areas, we've actually collaborated really well with with other sectors as well, especially on issues of, of technicality around rent or VAT or business rates. You know, these are businesses. You know, the hospitality sector is run is, is business led. The fitness and leisure sector is business led as well. The unique carve out that we have, and especially it's very important in how the government views this lockdown is, you know, we are a sector that has is explicitly linked to uh, the the physical and mental well-being of the nation. Remove us, 
and the impact on the on the on the on the on the society will see a decline in activity levels and a, and a deterioration of mental health levels. And so, if you're looking at the prime minister's plans and his early plans around the obesity plan, if you're looking at issues around high street renewal, if you're looking at loneliness, isolation, if you're looking at the statistics which show um, the most impacted on on COVID, low, lower economic groups, Black Asian minority ethnic groups, vulnerable groups, these are our members. These are the members and these are the people who utilize these facilities. So you have to bring them back into play and you have to put them at the heart of the recovery of our nation, really. Who are you talking to? Have you got Boris on speed dial? Who in government are you able to actually get a hold of, Hugh? Well, the team has done a great job. And, you know, we have constructive dialogue from number 10 down, you know, across health, across DCMS, education, home office, um, communities, business. I mean, actually... The volume of conversations in some respects is a reflection on where the the sector is. You know, we actually kind of have in some ways too many conversations, you know, because we are, you know, there isn't probably, you know, we had, we had an event with Andy Burnham yesterday and he used a phrase he's used before, you know, physical activity is almost the orphan child of, of Westminster and Whitehall. It falls between too many cracks. There are too many departments that we need to engage in order to get the package of recovery and support and profile required, you know, so... There are multiple conversations taking place prior to this lockdown. You know, my team was speaking across the whole of the UK, speaking to local leaders um, and devolved administrations, you know, and actually that had great success because those guys are really close to the coalface, understand the role these facilities play in their local communities and we're keeping them open. They're going into tier three. So there's an intensity of engagement. Um, there'll be more conversations this afternoon and tomorrow and um, probably over the weekend as well. When we see the debate about uh, kids sports, uh, taking place as well um, and that's quite prevalent at the moment as in they can do it at school but they can't do it externally there's been no cases of transmission I think the scientists have said there's been no cases of transmission between kids in, in sports but is it more of a case that what the government is worried about is the gathering of parents and, and in fact are the, are the par- uh, you know are we all to blame for for not following the social distancing rules well, I think in that context, I think these 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 kids are already in our, in in a pre-agreed bubble. So the idea of extending um, physical activity hours for another hour before or after school seems, you know, completely sensible. I think some of the some of the language and narrative coming out of of government around activity activity, especially for kids, is needs to be reviewed significantly. Um, there is obviously self accountability for what's going on here, but you know there is a need. You know, if we you know, there is a, there is going into COVID, there was fundamental issues in terms of health inequalities across the country. Inactivity levels were a great disproportion between affluence and, and lo- lower income families. If we are a- unable to change the, unable to change the dial on, on, on the next generation coming through, we're just setting up major problems in health um, for, for people when they come into adulthood. And that is going to be the, the big challenge here. You know, the, the big messaging from the government has been about saving the NHS. Yeah, you save the NHS by getting people to use it less. And using it less has to come, be, come through public health initiatives, which are supporting the preventative agenda, where you can actually use activity, you know, to actually address some of the major societal challenges we have. You know, the amount of kids going into secondary school who are obese is, is unacceptable and is a shame on our country. Uh, and so this this period, especially around the physical and mental well-being of kids, is going to be a real area of, of, of focus for government. And we need to bring in levels of change there to support these kids going forward. Because like you, Hugh, I'm a huge fan of sport and want people to, to participate and watch. And I think it's great that, you know, elite sport is, is going to carry on and it will give some people some entertainment. But there is, as, as we're discussing the whole issue of not being able to get out and about and, 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 and participate ourselves. But what also really scares me is when you look at the hospitals and you look at how busy they are and the NHS, you know, going to alert one status overnight, etc. And that's where I, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, we have to respect uh, and, you know, a huge acknowledgement for the very difficult challenges and decisions the government has to make here. I think we need to look at it, you know, with with a level of of calmness and a level of dispassionacy when it's very difficult when when there's so much emotion here. What we do know is follow the evidence, you know, and and what we need to do is is follow that evidence and look at what's happening now. 
you can't have a situation where you make an intervention here to sort out a crisis but create another one. We see from the from the from the, the numbers from Sport England that you know activity learn went off a cliff edge. Number one. Number two is the scientific advisory group for the government Sage recommended on the 21st of September that if you closed gyms and leisure centres, it will have a minimal impact on on the R rate. Um, but what it will do is a, especially in the winter, see a significant decline in activity and also fuel mental health problems, um, especially among vulnerable groups. Now, you know, you've got to look at, the, look at the whole board here, look at the whole board and see what interventions you can make uh, and where, where you can actually continue a dialogue and continue um, a, a relationship with a sector. We see ourselves in a central service and a central service within communities. And if that's the case, then we can continue to support that with the highest standards that we have we are put in place to continue to support communities, especially in this challenging time. We will move on shortly and talk about some of your roles with London 2012. We definitely want to get to talk about the Olympics and Paralympics in London eight years ago shortly. But one sort of final point on this, and I'll give you the answer or what I think is the answer in one word, money. But why is Premier League football allowed to continue when grassroots sport, my weekly Zumba class or my park run or whatever it is, is unable to continue? Well, I think that the amount of work that, that elite sport, and I know a lot of the guys at the Premier League and are looking at what happened across, across cricket and, 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 and other sports this, this summer, the, the volume of work which was done to actually make sure that there was a level of, of, of protection amongst the players and you know, the, the associated staff. So you know, to be honest, I, I, you know, I don't see it as a trade-off between the Premier League continuing to, to, to perform and, and to have that, that league continuing and grassroots sports and activity. I think they've got to be seen in many ways in a different way. And I think, you know, look at the challenge that you're facing with grassroots sports and, and activity. Look at the, the implications of closure versus the outcomes of not. What is, the, what is the, the solution to maintaining these services going through these winter months? You know, that for me would be the right answer as opposed to what is a trade-off between parts of the sector. They all are independent. They all have a role to play. But for me, I think it's more about you know, what we can do to, to, to support and sustain important activity levels amongst people of all ages and backgrounds. And of course, I mentioned that you had various roles with the Olympics and Paralympics around 2012. You worked with the Greater London Authority, the Olympic Delivery Authority, DCMS as well. The mantra back then was inspire a generation. You can't do that when the sports centres are shut, can you? Well, it makes it more challenging and, and inspiring generation was obviously the, the, the buzzword. And I think, you know, whilst it's, I'm looking, you know, whilst we reflect on, on what 2012 did, I think the, what's coming up the track and you guys will appreciate it, is Commonwealth Games in 2022. What will we stand for as a, as a society in that, you know, there's a clear language, a clear narrative uh, from 2012. And, you know, we need to look at where we are as a society. How are we going to make sure that, you know, what is our message back to the world in terms of how we deliver those games? Whilst there will be challenging circumstances, we need to be clear on what our message is, what our legacy, using that word, will be from those games as well. And there's a lot you can do. You know, we're working really hard on going back to your point, John, on, on children, young people. Um, the biggest thing the government could do right now, working with us and partners, you know, we have a program called Open Doors, which is, which is opening uh, school facilities across, across the country, right? You know, let's open up all the school facilities during the summer holidays, during half terms, during Easter and allow kids to utilize these facilities. We don't need to build any more facilities. These, these facilities are closed. Bring in the collective power of the sport and physical activity sector to support kids, the most vulnerable kids who need that support. That is a plan which is on the table, which is mature, which is quote, oven ready and ready to go. We're talking to Hugh Edwards, the CEO of UK Active on Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. And Hugh, it seems like actually lockdown and everything that's happened this year has kind of shone a light on the fact that the sport industry is a bit undervalued in terms of the wider government looking at what you guys bring to us. Yeah, I think it's a good reflection, John. I think, um, you know, my boss is Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson. And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, she reminds me a 11, 12 medal winning gold medal winning Paralympian. Right. And, um, Look, she said that, you know, and has been very eloquent in saying there needs to be a fundamental shift in how sport and physical activity is valued across Whitehall. Fundamental shift. You know, you look at the impact, the economic impact is there. You look at the, the, the social impact across issues of 
crime reduction, education and date attainment, loneliness, isolation, mental well-being, as I've touched on before. You know, this is, this is a, a sector which can pay, have a transformative impact on many of the societal issues that the government has in its intro. Now, it needs to be backed uh, and it needs to be supported, not just through a period of which is raw in terms of survival, but what is the next vision for the next five, 10 years of working alongside? It should be on a pedestal. We should be celebrating with incredible um, pride, you know, the work that volunteers and organizations, community groups, my sector in the fitness and leisure sector does in the fabric of communities. And, and I think it, we need to have it valued in a very different way to what it is right now. And um, we touched on it earlier slightly, but obviously as a former DCMS employee, is it too big, that department, for, or, because it's got industries there that are, you know, much bigger than, say, the fishing industry or something like that. And it, it feels like they've all been clobbled together. And as, as we said earlier, they're kind of fighting for attention. But actually, there should be a, a separate sport kind of uh, department because, as you said, we've got the Commonwealth Games coming up. We've had the Olympics. It's a really good question. I think there's been a lot of debate around having a secretary tape for sport or, you know, making it sure it's carved out. I think ultimately decisions, especially looking at, you know, this government and how this government will operate over the next four years, you know, decision making comes at the top. You know, who owns it within number 10, within the number 10 operation? How are they going to set out their vision, their strategy for the role of sport and physical activity in our society? How are they going to mobilise the sector? you know, to actually have that role, I guess, across a number of those transformative areas. And I think ultimately you need to have the champion. Yes, DCMS do, you know, in, in circumstances that are really trying to support the sector as much as they can. But ultimately decision making is made in number 10. And number 10 need to own, you know, a, a, a vision and a strategy for what they want from the sector and how they're going to look to leverage and, and maximise the value the sector can play across many areas. Picking up on what you've just said there, obviously, about the impact of London 2012 and the great work that you and your colleagues did in delivering the Olympics and Paralympics, put the pandemic aside for a moment, but was it a slightly missed opportunity? Or had we not driven forward in the way that maybe we would have hoped in the seven, eight years? It's interesting. I think legacy is an interesting word, right? You know, and, and it's been something which we've all reflected on since 2012. I think, you know, I was very much involved at the Olympic Delivery Authority, working with people like David Higgins and John Armit, um, who led that organisation on the physical legacy. Um, you know, I go around the Olympic Park now, eight years on, and there is no way that that part of London, you know, would have would have had that level of transformation in terms of sports facilities, job creation, housing, fundamental regeneration, and it was a it was a it would never have happened and and so that that area when you look at legacy and, and infrastructure legacy then you can say yeah i mean it stands up i think in terms of sporting legacy or activity legacy i think the most important moment was actually the the plans that tracy crouch brought in in 2015 2016 when he completely ripped up the way that that sport was measured by government you know and sporting future was one of the most important documents You're looking at we need to have a cross you know the vision of having this cross departmental approach what do we really want from, from this sector? You know, how is it going to impact on the physical, mental and social well-being of the nation, apart from just collecting numbers? And, 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 and Tracy's vision working with, with Sport England was, was, was very important. Now, we need a second kick on from that in terms of really delivering, you know, value and understanding across Whitehall, which becomes very difficult, which then goes back to my point of ultimate ownership within the power within number 10 cabinet office to drive forward this. Your organisation obviously does a lot of fantastic work, but if Whitehall's going to listen, does sport need to do its bit, perhaps a slightly more joined up approach? You've got UK Active, that you're the CEO. Across the way, you've got Sport England. Then you've got organisations like England Athletics or Scotland Athletics, Swim England feeding into them. Do those organisations need to, to get their heads together a little bit more around the table? Yeah, I mean, I know you've spoken to Tim at, at Sport England and, you know, we've got a strategic partnership with Sport England and, and work very closely with them. And there are, you know, organisations that you've mentioned, you know, who have a representative role to play. I think providing a, you know, there's more work we can all collectively do in, in making that coherent message. I think one of the things we should reflect on is, you know, in my time in this, you know, having 150 leaders from across sport and physical activity write a letter to the Prime Minister in September, setting out a vision for a sports recovery plan um has it, it was was quite a, a a unique moment and but should become as you rightly say michael the the norm rather than the exception how can we 
lobby as a collective in a much more effective way than we have probably done historically as a, as a, as a sector. You mentioned the Olympic Park, uh, my second home, I like to call it. Um, is that the most proud thing that you've done? Or is, is there something else that you're more proud of that you achieve with London 2012? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, becoming chief executive of UK Active and representing the sector. And, you know, first time chief executive made last August was a hugely pro, you know, proud moment for me as an individual. Uh, I think 2012 is slightly different. You know, I did six years there, five years for the ODA, one year for the ECMS. And as a Londoner, you know, I, it was a great level of pride. I mean, I, my team, the team I work with, you know, so many of them we're still in contact with and great friends of because of the journey. You know, it was taking an area which was, you know, in terms of the physical side of it, taking an area of, of urban decay, generational decay and transforming it over five years, hitting the milestones, working with, with individuals surrounded by individuals who are world class across design, architecture, health and safety, construction um, was, was well, I was just taking it all in, right? And, and, and seeing the evolution year after year. And I think, you know, one of the things we learned was, was, you know, if you'd have said in 2006, walking around that park, this will be a park in five years, you know, it would have been impossible to, to comprehend. You take people on a journey with you. You take people on a journey, tell them the story of how this park is going to evolve. Um, which is what we did. And that was the greatest achievement in terms of stakeholder engagement, comms, you know, business engagement, public affairs engagement, political engagement as well. To see the evolution before your very eyes was, was a very proud moment. Hugh, you said decision making happens at number 10. What is your message today to Boris Johnson? I think it's collaboration. I think sit down, you know, I think the most important thing is you need to sit down with the sector during this period of, of closure again and come up with a real plan come up with a real plan about how you're going to support the sector with a recovery plan, which covers investment regulation and taxation support uh, with incentivizations to, to build back consumer confidence uh, and come back with a plan about how you're going to value the sector going forward, you know, have a real strategy for how you're going to utilize it, how it can deliver many of the, the challenges and the ambitions you have around your own obesity strategy as well, which he's announced. So collaborate, sit down and let's work out a plan together. Hugh Edwards, CEO of UK Active. Thank you so much for talking to Great British Bosses. Thank you very much. Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BDW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.